Hey Nintendo fans, and Happy New Year! We're already a little into 2018 already, so let's get straight to the rules on this year's list. One, these are my personal favorites, just completely subjective. Two, no console ports. And three, the games have to be exclusive to Nintendo developers or platforms. It was an awesome year for Nintendo, so let's get started. Number 10. Golf Story. When I first picked up Golf Story, I had no idea that it was actually a Nintendo Switch exclusive. It just looks like the kind of thing that you can find on Steam, but as of now, it looks like Sidebar Games plans to keep this game on the Switch alone as a sort of spiritual successor to Mario Golf. Golf Story is ambitious, silly, and fun. It plays just like a top-down Game Boy Mario Golf game, but with the added open-world twist of being able to tee up anywhere at any time and interact with the world around you. There's a ton of individual quests and challenges that change the way that you play as well. The overall golfing system is solid and easy to grasp at a basic level, especially if you've played a game like Mario Golf before. Although I do wish the game was a little better at explaining its finer skills to the player earlier in the game. Even if you aren't that into golf though, Golf's story really shines with its dialogue. It's constantly witty and ridiculous, and the animated speech bubbles add a ton of character. It was probably the funniest game I played this year, which was a big surprise. I did run across a couple coarse bugs along my 15 hour playthrough of this game on stream, but the overall charm and color of the world kept me interested the entire time. Number 9 Snipper Clips Cut It Out Together When the Nintendo Switch was revealed, one of its more interesting features was the Joy-Con, a detachable controller that can easily become two miniature controllers for simple co-op play. There are a handful of games out there that use this functionality well, but I think Snipper Clips nails it the best. It's an extremely clever puzzle game that has you and a friend cutting different shapes out of each other, creating a bizarre Picasso-like character to interact with the world in a lot of different ways. You might be creating a crank to help turn a wheel, or making a bucket-like shape to hold some liquid, or finding a way to work together to dunk a basketball. Variety is the spice of life, and the sheer number of ways that the Snipperclips formula can be applied to creative tasks is pretty impressive. Some puzzles are a little less intuitive than others, and might have your group cursing each other out as you continue to fail, but I'd say the overall experience is pleasantly challenging. This was my go-to party game for 2017. Easy to understand, challenging to master, and by far my favorite way to split up the Joy-Con and hand it to a friend. Number 8 Fire Emblem Echoes – Shadows of Valentia it took Fire Emblem a long time to make its way to the West, with the game that many of us know as Fire Emblem actually being the seventh main series title in the franchise. I've been waiting for the day that we get more of those Japan exclusive games updated for a modern audience here in the West, but never on earth did I imagine that that next game would be a remake of 1992's Fire Emblem Gaiden. This is a weird game, with no traditional weapon triangle system, a flexible style of class promotion, dungeon crawling, and a split story that has you following two separate armies. Fire Emblem Echoes feels like the exact antithesis of the newest modern Fire Emblem 3DS titles, for better and for worse. On the good end, this game's story, presentation, and characters are top-notch. The character designs are incredible without being absurd, and the new addition of full voice acting is something that I think every future Fire Emblem game should have. I found myself genuinely invested in Almond Selica's journey, which was simple but interesting to follow without becoming bloated with too many characters. On the downside, I did find that this game's map and combat mechanics are a little too simple for my taste. While the recent Fates games are a narrative disaster, I really did enjoy the challenge and interactive map elements of Conquest especially to be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, most of Echoes' maps feel identical to the Famicom original, usually just asking you to clear out a large death ball of enemies without too much thought. It definitely has its moments where you have to consider the environment and enemy types, but I think this game's biggest fault is its 25-year-old maps. Someday, I hope that we can see that perfect presentation and characters from Echoes met alongside with that modern map design. I have a good feeling that we'll see these things meet up in the next main series title for the Nintendo Switch, but only time will tell. On a complete side note, I also give an honorable mention this year to the mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes. It's a silly gotcha game, but I think it's a great blend of on-the-go combat puzzles alongside a way to celebrate hundreds of individual Fire Emblem characters over the entire franchise's history. It blows my mind to see a franchise that was almost dead to see so much support these days, but hey, I'll take it. Number 7 Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is THE anime game. Huge over-the-top fantasy battles, absurd fan service, endless cutscenes and all. 
The shift in tone compared to the more grounded Chronicles and Chronicles X games definitely threw me off at first, but it's still a truly massive JRPG with a rewarding combat system to master. Chronicles 2 definitely isn't for everybody, and it's easy to write up a laundry list of complaints. The tutorials are poor and there's no way to reread them, the maps are confusing to understand vertically, some quests rely on random drops, the story sometimes blocks your progression completely unless you've grinded enough of those HM-like skills, some chapters felt like I spent more time in cutscenes than actual gameplay, the list goes on and on. But this game still kept my attention a lot longer than most this year at about 100 hours, so obviously it did something right. It's a mix of that classic Xenoblade action RPG gameplay with a new twist of the Persona-like blade mechanic. Your blades are summoned out of this random pool, meaning that different playthroughs will have completely different parties. This can be a source of frustration, but it's also kind of fun knowing that your main party might be full of completely different blades than somebody else's playthrough. Each blade was designed by a handful of famous video game and manga artists, and while the worst designs are very easy to make fun of, there are a ton of interesting variety throughout that keeps these partners fun to discover. They even have a character from the old Xenosaga games, and that was a fun throwback. When it all clicks, firing off a huge combo where you can cancel attacks into arts and then quickly unleash an elemental force of nature on the field is insanely satisfying. The move to a more cel-shaded style of character also works really well with the game's gorgeous landscapes and enemies. Even though the Xenoblade games have never had impressive individual textures, their worlds have always been beautiful, and this one is probably the peak of that philosophy. The story, while not as good to me as the first Chronicles game, was still a tale that I found worth pursuing to the end. It has some high highs and some low lows, but Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was ultimately a game that I'm happy to have explored at the end of this year. Number 6 Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon This is a weird game to place. I think this is one of the most complete handheld Pokemon titles to date crammed with optional features, challenges, minigames, and modes to an almost intimidating degree. There are so many things to do in this game that I still have some minigames that I've left almost completely untouched. However, as a whole experience, despite the fun new additions, I felt like the main single player adventure was about 80% or more the exact same as the original Pokemon Sun and Moon games. There are a few story differences with plenty of remixed wild Pokemon in battles, but if you were hoping for the Ultra games to provide a complete brand new world similar to the Black and White 2 games, I think I can understand where some players can feel disappointed. As someone that plays Pokemon mostly for that single player adventure, I'm somewhere in the middle. A huge chunk of this game felt really repetitive because I just completed an Alolan journey just one year ago. Some of the story changes are great, especially the remix trials, but others had me a little more confused. Some of the game's alternative side quests ranged from hilarious to horrifying, and they were probably the highlight for me. Like most, I found the Rainbow Rocket post-game to be a really fun and nostalgic way to wrap up the final 3DS Pokemon adventure, and I did find myself pretty addicted to wormhole hunting and Mantine surfing. If this was my first time playing through Alola, I think this game would be way higher on my list. But viewed through the lens of playing through almost this exact same game a year ago, I found this game to be great, but not world-changing. I personally hope for a future where Game Freak packs their new Pokemon games full of content like this from the beginning instead of needing to sell an alternate or enhanced version to get the full experience later. Either way, I can't wait to see this main franchise make its way to the Nintendo Switch in the coming years. Number 5 Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle Who knew that my favorite turn-based game this year would include this? I've always found the Rabbids kind of repulsive, never understanding how they were able to spin off from being a Rayman side character into making their own games. They are literally the equivalent of the despicable Mii Minions. But it turns out that if you can make a video game as fun and well-polished as Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, I can look past anything I don't like. This game takes the established modern XCOM strategy cover shooter skin and perfectly adapts it to the Mario universe. It's one of the best examples of a game that's easy to understand on the outside, but absurdly complex in practice. The percentages for hitting are so much easier to understand than XCOM, but any number of special attacks or effects might send one of your armies flying all over the place, forcing you to adapt and improve. Its difficulty curve is also all over the place, with some levels feeling easily cheesed while others feeling merciless, but I definitely enjoyed the overall combat formula a ton. By the time I hit the end, the game's world really started to grow on me. Grant Kirkhope's soundtrack is lively and hectic as any of his works, and the enemy animations are full of personality. The co-op challenges are great, and the new Versus mode was a nice surprise addition at the end of the year. I wish these modes are online as well, but as a game that's focused on a single player experience, I was really happy with this adventure from start to finish. Number 4 
Metroid, Samus Returns. It's kind of uncanny. This year we saw not one, but two 3DS remakes of old Nintendo franchise sequels from the early 90s. The difference between Fire Emblem and this game though is that we somehow haven't seen a traditional 2D Metroid title since 2004. Mercury Stream had pretty big shoes to fill on this one, and after the 3DS Castlevania, it didn't really have huge expectations. But honestly, I think they crushed it. They took the generally boring Metroid 2 and spiced it up with a variety of new special Aeon abilities that feel fun and helpful without breaking the game. While many of the new additions, such as free aiming and the counter, are focused on combat, the game still manages to have that classic Metroid feel of exploration and occasional terror. I think the true highlight of this game is in its bosses, which are full of unique attack patterns and multiple effective strategies. That being said, some of the bosses do start to feel a little monotonous once you've battled that same Metroid type enough times. There are a lot of creative Metroid boss twists that I don't want to spoil, but some of the monotony of the original Metroid 2 game does come back here. While I may not ever like the blockier 3D models when compared to clean 2D sprite work, I actually do think this is one of the 3DS's best looking games, especially with the 3D turned on. Samus Returns earned my classic Metroid triple playthrough. One casual, one for completion, and one for speed. While I am extremely anxious to hear more about Metroid Prime 4, I'm really hoping that we don't have to wait another decade before we see the next 2D Metroid title. The formula still works. Number 3. Splatoon 2. Most of what I said about Splatoon 1 a few years back as Game of the Year still applies today to Splatoon 2. It seems that Splatoon 2 has adopted the Splatoon 1 strategy of releasing content. Launch your game feeling like it could use a little more content, and then slowly drip feed free DLC that adds stuff until your game truly feels like a great value a year later. Splatoon 2 is a solid but safe addition in Nintendo's most successful new IP in ages. A couple of new weapon types, some new characters and features, and a brand new addicting zombie style co-op mode had Splatoon 2 feeling like a true safe sequel to me. Same great formula, but maybe not enough overall changes where I'd consider it to be a perfect sequel. But then they do that Splatoon thing where they start rolling out the new stuff. First it's some new weapons that actually function under new gameplay mechanics, and then it's tons of new maps, including most favorites from the first games, plenty of community Splatfest events, and then suddenly, can it be? It is! Clam Blitz, baby! Don't ask me why it took half a year for Splatoon 2 to finally get a new competitive mode that wasn't in the original Splatoon 1, but this mode alone has breathed a ton of new life into a game that I didn't even think existed. It's such a wild mode, too. If I had to describe it, I'd say it's like Coin Rush meets American Football? It's so weird and so fun, and unlike the other Splatoon 2 modes, it actually feels like a game type that's completely unique to Splatoon instead of something that feels like something I could find in another cooperative shooter. I personally wish this kind of content came at launch, but now that it's finally here, I couldn't be happier. Nintendo has claimed that there will be content updates for about a year, so it's one of those games that I almost feel like I'm reviewing in progress. As of December 2017 though, the game has reached a perfect blend of classic Splatoon third-person action along with new innovations that keep it worthy of a sequel of the Wii U legend. Number, Number 2 Number 1 The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and Super Mario Odyssey. Surprising almost no one, it turns out that my favorite games this year were Mario and Zelda. It isn't often we ever see main series titles coming from both of these franchises in the same year, and in my opinion, these games make the strongest single year Nintendo 1-2 punch that we've seen in a long time. But which one's number one, and which one's number two? I thought I'd talk about each of these games side by side to make it more interesting. Both Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey have a combined theme of freedom. Mario Odyssey with its open worlds and flexible missions, and Breath of the Wild with its completely open dungeon order. Both games also value player time a lot, allowing the player an abundant number of ways to fast travel and revisit old locations easily. Both games also function around an addicting main collectible supported by an optional side one, with moons and purple coins in Odyssey, and shrines and Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild. Heck, both games even have a built-in camera system, observing that players might want to take unique screen caps of their adventure outside of the usual screen capture tool. Beyond this theme, these games diverge, not shockingly, because one's a platformer and one's an action-adventure game. But for the sake of this top 10, I want to talk about a few things that I enjoyed in some of these games over the others. I think that Mario Odyssey is an overall more polished game. Its levels and mechanics are more tightly focused. Mario controls extremely well, and while there are certain tricks that can break levels wide open, I feel like the game has overall more of a consistent game feel. It flows naturally and consistently. Breath of the Wild is certainly 
pun intended, more wild. Its systems are solid, but it's much more inconsistent. This can sometimes lead to frustrating climbing or movement, but on the flip side, this is something that I like to call the jank factor. Sometimes he can pull off something with the physics engine that is so stupid or unbelievable that it actually becomes more memorable than if you were just playing it regularly. Almost every puzzle in this game has solutions that you can solve with your own creative ideas outside of the box, even if it is occasionally immersion breaking. Mario Odyssey is also graphically superior. The backend system of its visuals are actually incredibly complicated, but in general, the game does whatever it can to ensure that your game remains a full 60 frames per second as often as possible, jumping between resolutions that I would say are better and worse than 720p at different points in gameplay. The end result is an experience that is smooth and impressive, especially when contained down to the game's undocked portable mode. Breath of the Wild is a game that I would argue is more beautiful, with its picturesque wildlife landscapes and impressive monster designs, but it is absolutely more technically limited. The overall experience is locked at 30 frames per second, dipping even further below that at stress points like Villages, and even more frequently if you're playing on the Wii U version. Mario Odyssey has better music, with more memorable tunes that fit various wacky worlds, more variety, and more songs that I can remember off the top of my head. Breath of the Wild has some great usage of atmospheric music and some fantastic sound effects, but there are only a small handful of songs that I can actively say I remember from the game off the top of my head. Breath of the Wild has a better use of motion controls, pretty much only using the gyroscope for motion aiming and it works, and that's it. Mario Odyssey gets a little too ambitious with the tacked on shake controls, which I found to be especially frustrating when playing the game in its undocked mode. One thing that I found really interesting to note, and this is mostly due to how each genre works, is how each game handles progression. Mario Odyssey has no permanent power-ups, no new skills, no unlockable tricks. You start the game with Mario's full arsenal right from the beginning, and the game slowly gets harder throughout. I think Mario's difficulty curve is a little too back-loaded. Some of the game's best and most interesting challenges only appear after you've beaten the main story, which has some players declaring the game too easy and putting it down before ever reaching some of the juiciest stuff. Breath of the Wild, on the other hand, is built around your character getting better gear and becoming stronger over time. Its difficulty curve is wildly inconsistent, but most of the challenge lies at the beginning when you have nothing and you build yourself up. As you get the best gear, arrows, food, and weapons, the game can become comically easy, but it does do a great job of making the player feel like they've become a worthy hero. One thing I'd say both games suffer from a little bit is bloat. Mario Odyssey really likes giving you moons at every step of the way, some of them feeling like they required little to no effort to receive, distracting from the moons that were actually impressive. Meanwhile, I find myself ignoring a majority of Korok Seed quests no matter how many times I play Breath of the Wild, because I just can't get into it. These puzzles don't do it for me, but the shrines really do. Alright, that's enough talk. You ready for my Nintendo Game of the Year? Maybe not what you were expecting. So what's going on here? I think Mario Odyssey is tighter, better graphically, better level design, and has better music. But there's one big factor that Breath of the Wild had for me that you just can't boil down to a simple review science. And that's fun. I had a little more fun playing Breath of the Wild. I also got a lot more addicted to it. Of all the games I played this year, Breath of the Wild by far had the biggest, oh my god, it's 3 a.m. and I still want to keep playing, what am I doing with my life, factor. I just couldn't put it down. There's some magical, intangible formula that had me constantly booting up new Breath of the Wild save files all year. Odyssey is definitely a whole lot more fun to speedrun, and that kept me playing the game from time to time, but there's a strange allure to Zelda's open world nonsense that keeps me coming back and goofing around over and over again. The fact that I even had to consider these games against each other in the same year says a lot about Nintendo's first party efforts. They're both individually some of the best single player games I've ever played, and they both dropped in the same system in 2017. It's gonna be a really hard year for Nintendo to top, and it will be interesting to see how they handle having essentially one system for what used to be a home console and handheld split. There were great video games all year long on every platform, even outside of Nintendo, but it's always nice to see the big N on an up year. Thank you guys so much for following my content over a pretty crazy year on this channel, and I'll see you guys again with more Nintendo content in 2018.